Okay. Uh, well, first of all, let me thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate. I don't ordinarily uh, work on monetary policy. Uh, as you can see, I decided to wear green in Alex's honor. Uh, okay. So uh, this paper addresses an important uh, question. How is it that monetary unions between independent countries are sustained over time? Uh, there are both, uh, several interesting examples where monetary unions more or less function uh, over a long period of time in history. Uh, the Latin Amer Monetary Union, the Scandinavian Monetary Union, uh, the CFA front is still going on. Uh, it's divided into two parts, but that's not all that important. Uh, the distinction is the same currency. And the European Monetary Union, uh, all of these countries in the EU, and uh, I discovered also that Monaco, San Marino, and Vatican City also print a certain amount of notes. Um, earlier papers on uh, this subject uh, nearly demonstrated that the expected utility derived from monetary union was larger than that obtained under the non-cooperative uh, national equilibrium. Uh, once the commitment was made, uh, the monetary union is either irreversible, or in many instances, the models that uh, were created uh, were effectively static. Uh, so I'm thinking about Alessina and Greeley in 1993. Um, recent papers uh, are now treating monetary unions as repeated games, where good behavior uh, where good behavior is enforced endogenously by punishment strategies that are credible because they yield uh, some game perfect equilibrium. Uh, so recent papers uh, treat monetary unions as repeated games. Um, where good behavior is enforced endogenously by punishment strategies that are credible because they yield sub-game perfect equilibrium. This paper generalizes Dixit 2000 uh, by permitting countries to not merely cheat and lobby, those are his words, uh, Dixit's words, uh, for preferred policies, but also dissolve the union by mutual consent. Um, indeed, dissolution by mutual consent can be an equilibrium outcome uh, as was demonstrated here, depending on the nature of the economies or the shocks. Now, unilateral secession from the monetary union uh, is strictly an off-equilibrium phenomenon uh, in this model. And that I find a little troubling, and that might be a function of my, my ignorance, the, the fact that I, I don't work in this field. Uh, but is there really a difference between unilateral uh, secession and dissolution by mutual consent if one country engages in disruptive fiscal policy, for example, France decides to continue to run high deficits, uh, Germany uh, continues to run high deficits. Uh, you mentioned the question, uh, uh, extending this to uh, uh, marriage and divorce. So for example, if I come home tonight and I declare that I'm no longer going to do the dishes or help clean the house or take up the garbage when I'm told, um, you know, my wife will do the logical thing and she'll kick me out. And uh, then the question becomes, uh, is this unilateral uh, divorce on my part or is this by mutual consent? I mean, the distinction is kind of fuzzy, at least as best as I can tell. Um, the distinction is, uh, is, is important because monetary union with enforcement is occasionally a first best. Most of the time in this paper, it's a second best. Um, but, but because the motivation for the paper is that this is endogenously sustainable, the question is, how do you deal with all these other uh, variables, these fiscal variables that aren't necessarily explicitly uh, spelled out? Uh, are they within the policy strategy, these pies that I'll show in a moment? So, now, for me, these are some surprising features of the paper, and this reflects, to some extent, the fact that I'm less familiar with this literature. So it's a paper about monetary policy, to some extent, uh, but no description of interest rates, money supply, money demand, inflation, exchange rates, or devaluations. This is actually typical of the literature, uh, with the exception of Cooley and Quadrini, 2003, who have a, a less stylized model of the economy, but on the other hand, their paper has a much less sophisticated uh, game theory. Uh, it's uh, essentially a two-period uh, uh, repeated game. 
uh, monetary policy in this paper is a policy plan, as defined over there, uh, is a stochastic vector process which maps any possible history, HT, into a policy choice, pi t, for all, all t. So this is fairly broad, and maybe it includes within it fiscal policy, though that wasn't clear to me from the paper. The model does not motivate the existence of money in the economy. Again, uh, that's uh, pretty common in this literature. Indeed, there's no money at all in the economy, as best as I can tell. Um, now, th that leads me to my, uh, my, my next point, which is that everything in this model, uh, with very few alterations, could be applied to the question of fiscal policy, uh, where different countries compete to attract investment by lowering tax rates. In fact, in many ways, this might actually be a better application uh, the the uh, fear in the European Union today is of a fiscal race to bottom, particularly when they're looking at Eastern European countries uh, instituting these very low flat rate taxes. The question becomes, uh, how do you put together a union where there's going to be some sort of coordinated uh, tax policy? And the reason why I would think of fiscal policy is that I come from a school of thought that perhaps is a little skeptical of the, uh, of the um, Phillips curve, but we have really good models that describe things like, uh, like deadweight loss and optimal fiscal policy. So that might be a, a way of fairly easily putting in a, 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 a more fully uh, explored economy. Now, the policy coordination required for monetary union, uh, we all know, does not end with the establishment of a, currency, a common currency, but requires countries to obey restrictions on f fiscal policy as well. I'm thinking in particular of Sargent and Wallace. Uh, that was understood under Maastricht and all the uh, agreement, uh, agreements that were signed there. But again, it's not explicit within the model. Uh, it may be what you mean when you describe these pies here, but it just isn't clear to me. To, to somebody who's reading this a little bit from the outside, um, do you account for things like unpleasant monetary arith monetarist arithmetic? Now, uh, a, a few comments about, uh, so uh, taking a, a quote from the paper, uh, the loss of a policy instrument, money print, inherent in the MU uh, monetary union generates costs and benefits. The costs, the cost is that uh, countries in the MU are forced to use the same policy, which may be inefficient when countries are hit by asymmetric shocks. On the other hand, the benefit arises from the fact that single money print makes unilateral, unilateral surprise deviations from any agreed policy impossible. Well, we have some recent examples of money, money prints. Uh, well, before I, I say that, uh, for, again, there's a, a fisc, there's a kind of a Phillips curve hidden here. Um, though it's not explicitly said so. Uh, and it becomes more explicit in the example uh, that they give. Um, it's not, well, it, uh, I'm going to come back to that in a moment when I, I, I in my last slides. Uh, 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 two more points I, I, I want to make. Uh, from uh, Fuchs and Lippi, we assume that a country's decision to abandon the union uh, reinstalling its money, money print in currency does not come as a surprise to the other country. This is a realistic assumption justified by noting that the decision to leave the MU takes more time and is more easily observed by the other parties than the decision to deviate from the policy under INP. In other words, when you dissolve the uh, monetary union. Well, there's some recent examples. This is an example of uh, the Soviet Union uh, breaking up and these various countries, successor republics, establishing uh, their own currencies. And it would be interesting to use these as examples and see how difficult it was to actually set up their own money prints. I agree that it's not likely to come as a surprise, uh, but the example that I think is kind of the most illuminating is from Tom Sargent in the end of, uh, ends of Four Big Inflations. Uh, so he gives uh, the description of uh, Czechoslovakia after World War I. The new nation of Czechoslovakia was formed out of territories formerly belonging to Austria and Hungary uh, under the leadership of the distinguished Minister of Finance, Dr. Alois Razin. I, I don't imagine this, he's related to uh, our, our Asaf. Uh, immediately after the war, Czechoslovakia adopted the 
uh, conservative fiscal policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Under Rosin's leadership, Czechoslovakia early on showed that it was serious about attaining a stable currency. Even before the peace treaties uh, required it, Czechoslovakia stamped the Austro-Hungarian notes, then circulating within its border with a Czechoslovakian stamp, thereby recognizing them as its own debt. There was considerable drama associated with this event as the National Assembly passed plans for stamping its in-secret sessions on, on uh, 25th of February 1919, from 26th February to 9th of March, the frontiers of the country were unexpectedly closed and foreign mail service was closed. Only Austro-Hungarian notes circulating within the country could be pre presented for stamping. In other words, the, here we have an example of doing exactly what it is that you're describing. Uh, whether that is conceivable in today's European Union, I'll leave to you. Now, I want to come back to this uh, Phillips curve uh, for a moment. Um, for me, it's very hard to understand this kind of utility function. I, as a representative uh, consumer, uh, I, as somebody who survived the hyperinflation here in Israel, what the government gets by playing around with doing activist mantras policy to uh, hurt somebody else. Uh, but I can understand it at the level of, let's say, some government. So if there is some very temporary Phillips curve, maybe the government gets some sort of benefit short term uh, even if long-term the, the population suffers uh, from manipulating uh, monetary policy. Uh, so I'd like to make a suggestion about how to just slightly order, o alter the utility function. And what I would suggest, so this is the condition you set up for the uh, existence, a necessary condition for the existence of the monetary union, uh, where neither country deviates, where this is in essence the policy maker, but it's also some representative consumer. And though I'm not usually a big fan of hyperbolic discounting, in this case, I think it has some merit where it's more of a political economy story, where we're, not, we're no longer talking about representative agents, but we're talking about policy makers, let's say governments. And what, we have, what I've done is I've divided up the, util, the intertemporal utility function into two pieces, where the sigma star and the sigma uh, that's the time of the next election. And there is a discount factor up to the election and presumably a lower discount, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, a, a lower, di a higher discount factor after the election so that they're, they put a lot of more weight on what happens just prior to being elected. And this, is, this raises, first of all, I think this would be more realistic, but it also raises uh, some uh, unhappy possibilities because even if we assume that all the discount factors in both home and foreign are the same, what happens if the election cycles are different? What happens if the sigma star and the sigma are not the same? So one country is going to an election next year and the other country is going to an election in two years and whether this particular framework can or cannot sustain uh, monetary policy or monetary union uh, with this kind of uh, a configuration. Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop there.